When I was a little boy, uh, the best way to impress my father was to place myself in the most perilous position possible. My father was a cowboy in every sense of the word. He was a man born 150 years too late. My father's worn a cowboy hat, cowboy boots, and a cowboy belt buckle for every day that I have ever known him. My father's name is Leslie Jean Dix. <laughs> and he goes by the name Les Dix. <laughs> you have never met a tougher man in your life. I grew up on a horse farm in Blackstone, Massachusetts, and my father <laughs> and my father would board horses and he would train them. He was a blacksmith. But the thing that he was most known for was being able to break the horse that couldn't be broken. I would stand in front of the barn and I would just listen as a stallion inside would bang against the walls and smash the door and knock over bales of hay and rip open bags of feed. It was like there was an explosion going on and the whole barn shook. And then my father would go into the barn with nothing but an apple in his hand. And for the first five, 10, 15 minutes, the banging would go on and the pounding and the explosions, but then it would start to die down and the banging would stop and it would get quiet. And then my father would come out of the barn on the back of the horse that no one could ride. It was like having Superman as your father. Clark Kent goes into the phone booth and out comes the Man of Steel. And I spent my childhood trying to impress and earn the love of this superhero of a father. So I would go in the barn and I would get on the biggest horse I could and ride it out to the ring. I was seven years old. I was on a horse three times my size bareback. And if the walk around the ring seemed a little too easy, my father would whistle and the horse would break into a trot. I was the living embodiment of the phrase, if you fall off a horse, you need to get right back on. <laughs> I remember there was a day we were mucking the stalls and we had this mean little pony named Flicker. And Flicker reached out of the stall and bit me in the stomach. And I yelled to my father, Dad, Flicker has me, he won't let go. And my father looked at me from underneath that hat and he smiled and said, he's just got your coat. <laughs> and because it was my father, I grinned and bared it until Flicker let go. And then I held up my shirt to show him the welt. I don't think my father has ever been more proud of me than that moment. <laughs> Now, there were ways inside the house I could earn his respect as well. One of our favorite games was, who can stay in the dryer the longest? <laughs> My sister would win that game most often because she was really small and the least claustrophobic of all of us. But if she got cocky and stayed in there too long, my father would turn the dryer on and send her for a tumble. My father would pay us to eat the raw salt pork out of a can of baked beans, and the one who did it for the least amount of money would win. And my brother would always win because he would do it for free. <laughs> and we used to play a game where my father would lie on his back on the dining room table with his arms outstretched, and we would stand in his hands, and he would lift us up, and the person who could stay balanced the longest would win. If you were lucky when you fell, you'd fall on his chest and he'd grab you and hold you tight. And if you were unlucky, you'd tip to the left or the right and you'd hit the dining room table. <laughs> and if you were really unlucky, you would bounce off the dining room table and onto the floor or into the wood pile next to the wood burning stove. It sounds like negligent parenting, even by 1970s standards, but it was a great time to be a boy. And it was a great time to be a kid. And that's what my father was. He went to Vietnam, he came back, he had three kids in three years, and then he spent the next seven years just playing with us, dangerously. <laughs> and then one day, I got off the school bus, and I went into the house, and my mother was sitting on the couch next to a man, and he told me his name was Mr. McKenna, and he was a social worker. And he was there to help us because our parents were getting divorced. And he started to tell us why and how 
it was going to happen. And I remember looking at my mother and she just looked so small and she barely said anything. And this man, Mr. McKenna, who I didn't know, just kept talking and talking and talking. And then just like that, my life changed. The boots were gone, the cowboy hat was gone, the belt buckles were gone. Within a week, the horses were gone from the stable and my father was gone. In about 14 seconds, after my parents' divorce was finalized, my mother remarried and she became Mrs. McKenna. And that social worker, Mr. McKenna, Neil, became my stepfather. And for a while it wasn't too bad because I saw my father and we would see him on the weekends and on holidays and I'd ride horses with him. But as the first year rolled into the second, I started seeing him less and less until I wasn't seeing him at all. And then I had this other man I had to impress, Neil, and he was nothing like my father. He wore white shirts and paisley ties. He drank vodka and wine instead of beer out of a can. He liked the Red Sox and the Celtics instead of the Patriots and the Bruins. And Neil liked everything that his real son, Ian, my stepbrother, liked. So Ian was a baseball player, so I decided I would become one too. But the family never had any money, so they gave me a hand-me-down baseball glove for a right-handed player, and I'm left-handed. So I had to learn to play baseball with the wrong hand. So even though Ian was three years younger than me, he was playing Babe Ruth and I was playing the farm league. But even when my farm league team made it to the championship and I was named an all-star, Neil never came to a game. And then we joined Boy Scouts and that was great for me and I became a patrol leader and a senior patrol leader and I was tying knots and surviving in the woods. And then one day Ian decided that Boy Scouts wasn't cool anymore. And so he quit and so did Neil. And I became the kid who would hide in the bushes at the end of a troop meeting until everyone was gone so I could walk home and not tell anyone I didn't have anyone to pick me up. I tried everything I could to impress Neil, to make him like me. I improved my grades. I tried to help out the family. I got a job at a farm and gave him the money. And money was always a problem in the family. And my mother and Neil fought all the time about it. I remember there was a time right before Christmas, they were fighting in the kitchen. And Neil was saying there wasn't going to be Christmas because we didn't have enough money. And I gathered my brothers and sisters in the basement. And we started pulling the tinsel off last year's Christmas tree and ironing it out, thinking if we could get the tinsel and they wouldn't have to buy that, then maybe we could have Christmas. But no matter what I did, I could not impress him. And then one day, they were fighting again in the kitchen. And Neil said that he was going to leave. And when he left, they were going to lose the house. And they weren't going to be able to feed us anymore. And my mother was going to be alone. And she was going to be penniless. And I couldn't take it anymore. I was 15 years old. So I went into the kitchen. And across the counter, I looked at him and I said, be a man. And he looked at me and he said, mind your own business. Go to your room. And so I did. And I slammed the door as hard as I could. And the house shook like that barn with the stallion. And then I heard Neil coming. And I knew he was coming for me. So I stood in the middle of my bedroom and I just waited. And he came into my room, he threw the door open and I said, what? And I got about halfway through that word before he hit me. He didn't punch me, he didn't slap me, he backhanded me and it sent me to the ground. But I was not going to let him put me on the ground. So I stood back up and I said, why don't you hit me again? And he did, twice as hard. And when I hit the ground, I was seeing stars. But I was my father's son, and I had fallen off horses and dining room tables, and I was not going to stay down. So I started to get up again, and Neil knew it. He knew me. And so he hit me before I could get to my feet. And this time, I wasn't getting up. And so he stood over me, and he said, what? And I had nothing to say, so he turned and he left. And while I was lying on my bedroom floor, I swore to myself, I made a promise that in three years, I will graduate high school, I will leave this house, and I will never see or speak to him again. And I turned my entire life from trying to hold my family together and make sure there was going to be food on the table to how can I get away from this family as fast as possible. And I kept my promise. When I turned 18, I left. 
And Neil kept his promise too. Two years after I left, he left my mom. After not paying the mortgage for a year and not telling her. And so the bank foreclosed on the house and she was penniless, just like he promised. And I kept my promise for 17 years until my mom died. And I was at the wake and I had my wife on one side of me and my brother on the other. And I was shaking hands through that line and listening to people tell me how sorry they were for me. And then before I knew it, I was shaking a hand and I looked up and it was Neil. And he looked at me and he said, I'm so sorry to hear that your mom passed. And for a minute, I didn't even know who it was. And then I remembered and I realized and I thought to myself, I'm 35 years old right now. I'm old enough to hit him like he had hit me that day. But I knew that I was old enough to know better and to not hit him the way he should have known way back when. Thank you.